sixth year that I got interviewed. The way the process works is there's over 4,000 people that apply to the, to, to the NASA program for the astronauts. Out of those 4,000, they down select 300. They check your references. Out of those 300, they'll select 100 lucky ones that get interviewed for one full week at NASA. These 100 people get invited. And, and of course, you get a battery of psychological exams. You get a battery of physical exams where you get poked and prodded everywhere. And those males over 40 know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then you get, and then you get, and then you get, um, and you get interviewed by, by a committee. You get interviewed by a committee. And then everybody goes home and you wait, you wait until you hear the results. And, um, and then, of course, you know, I, I sort of got cocky because I said, okay, ya la hice, I'm in the final 40s, me van a seleccionar. Of course, I got the news and I didn't get selected. And then, so the next two years went by for the next election. I got selected, uh, I mean, I, I got interviewed again year eight and the same thing happened, you know, went down to the 40 finalists and ni mangos, I didn't get anything, <laughs> yeah. I did get an invitation though. I did get in, I was finishing up my two year rotation here, getting ready to go back to California at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And, I, but I, and when I got the news that I didn't get selected year eight, and I, but I did get the invitation to go work for NASA as a civil servant. I was a contractor for DOE at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And, but all, you know, it came with some caveats. They said, well, you need to come back, you need to come work for us as an engineer. There's no guarantees that we'll even interview you again. We just want to have a better look at you. So, you know, we're making clear that we're not even going to guarantee that we're going to interview you. Uh, and by the way, you got to take a pay cut and you got to move to Houston. Uh, well, you can see how well that went over with my wife in a sense of saying, hey, honey, you know, we're not going to nice, Cali nice weather California. We're going to hot and muggy Houston. And by the way, you can't spend more money. You got to tighten up the belt. Uh, and, but in all honesty, though, she was actually the one that encouraged me because I was always, always look out for the family first. Cause that's the thing I was saying. You know, I had 13 years at Lawrence Livermore Lab, had a nice career going, nice trajectory, which is why they brought me to DOE so I can go back and manage a program when I came back. Uh, and so I had to give all that up. And my wife told me something that I would never forget. She says, you know, siempre vas a tener el gusanito. She's from Cotija, Michoacán. So, uh, she, she would say this in Spanish, Vas a tener el gusanito. you're always going to have that little worm inside you that's always going to be asking you, gnawing at you, saying, what if, what if, you know, if you didn't take that job, what would have happened? Because it was obvious that if I didn't take that job, they weren't going to consider me in the future. And, and so that sort of stuck with me. And she, said, and she said, you know, don't disqualify yourself. Let them disqualify you. Uh, so don't make that decision of not going. She said, let's go, we'll make ends meet, and we'll, we'll do all right in Houston. If you don't like it, then we'll go back to California. And so I took that risk in year eight, went and moved the family to uh, Houston, that was about 2000. And of course, I uh, found out with the understanding that there was gonna be a selection in 2002. Well, they canceled that selection and it, there wasn't a selection until 2004. So what ended up being a two year experiment was a four year experiment. But, uh, but I started working there uh, and put in four good years, uh, ended up being the branch chief of materials and processes branch. And, uh, and we actually uh, had the, uh, ha had the uh, shuttle uh, accident that, uh, th uh, that we had in uh, Columbia. And my group was, because we do non-destructive testing, so we do forensics. Uh, my group was very instrumental in doing the reconstruction of the accident and finding the root cause. So it, it, it sort of gave me visibility at the management level that when the new selections came by in 2004, when, uh, I, I, was actually, uh, I was actually selected. So it was 12 years after I started applying, three interviews before I finally got selected as a NASA astronaut in 2004. And, um, <laughs> and obviously, Obviously, uh, when you first get selected as an astronaut in 2004, you're not eligible for flight assignment because you're, you know, you're just coming off the street. So you get, you get uh, the title is actually astronaut candidate. And you train for two years, which was 2006, when we graduated and we became what we call card-carrying astronauts where we were eligible for a flight assignment. 
2008 was when I got my first assignment, uh, which is a STS-128 to fly on board uh, Discovery. Uh, and, and the date for the flight was last year. We trained for about 14 months as a group, uh, as a crew of seven. We, uh, we trained for 14 months and we uh, actually executed uh, the 128th mission of the space shuttles and ours was Discovery, which was the 32nd mission, and, and flew from August 28th to September 11th. During those 14 days, uh, we were up in space uh, and went around the Earth 217 times uh, at, at approximately 17,500 miles an hour and, uh, and, and traveled a total of 5.7 million miles. Uh, there's two things I always say about that is, uh, I wish there was a freaking flyer program for that. <laughs> and uh, and for, for the ladies, uh, tengo mucho kilometraje, pero don't worry about that, all right? Uh, I have a lot of mileage, but don't worry about that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the experience of, of going up in space is, is, is I mean, it's, you just cannot put words into it. I mean, it's just one of the most awesome feelings in the world. And let me just lay the groundwork for the launch. You know, you dress up in your orange pumpkin pressurized suit, you get strapped in the seat, and there's about three hours of nice quiet time that you could even take cat naps before the launch counts down to zero. And you're down there and you know, you have time to make peace with your maker, if you will, and 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 start reflecting. And you know, one of the best feelings I had there was I was sitting there, I was looking at my suits, looking at my partners there. And I was saying, you know, when I was my son's age, my son's 15, I was out picking cucumbers during the summers. I said, now I'm here representing the United States as an astronaut. Man, how cool is that? <laughs> it, it truly is. It truly is a great country where you can make dreams uh, a reality, and. As the count progressed, it progressed to zero, and you know you go from dead, silence, quiet, all of a sudden everything rattling and rolling, lots of noise, and uh, I don't remember, but my, my mission specialist one, I was I'm the flight engineer, so I sit right behind the two pilots. I get the best seat in the house, and 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 I'm also the busiest during those eight and a half minutes of the mo most dynamic phase of flight, uh, reaching space. But my neighbor said that as soon as it started taking off and everything, uh, and you feel the thrust as you finally go, you know, he said, que me se me I said, <laughs> I said I, you know, I don't remember, pero no me conste que I, I probably did. I'm a religious man, so I'm sure I did. But, you know, so I guess you can say for that millisecond, did I feel scared? Yeah, I probably did for that millisecond. You know, I, I did say to myself, what did I get myself into? You know, as it started <laughs> rattling and rolling, but then after that, you feel a thrust, and you're off the ground. You see the pad pass be, you know, on the side of you, and the tower, and, 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 and then your training takes over. It's amazing. You're programmed. Your training takes over. You start hawking all the instruments, start making sure you're making the milestones during those eight and a half minutes of dynamic flight. I call it the best Disneyland e-ticket ride ever. <laughs> um, and, and, and you reach space in those eight and a half minutes, and all of a sudden, you're, you're floating. Things are just floating, everything quiets down, and now you're going 17,500 miles an hour around the Earth, and which is truly amazing, truly amazing. And we, we, we joined with the International Space Station, it took us one day to get close to it and dock to it. We, we performed three main objectives. We traded one of our crew members, Nicole Stott, a woman engineer. Uh, we traded her for another person who had been up there for four months, uh, Tim Copra brought him home. We conducted three spacewalks, and then uh, and then we we also transferred seven tons of uh, material and equipment, including exercise equipment for the crew that's going to stay on the International Space Station. During that time, that dock time, there were seven of us from from the shuttle, six from the station, total of 13 astronauts up there. It's an International Space Station that's completely built now, as of the last mission, the size of about five bedroom home. And, uh, and there was 13 of us there, didn't feel crowded at all, representing five countries. I always say six countries if you include Mexico, because I always, <laughs> always put a plug in for Mexico there. 
Uh, and, uh, and, 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 so, and so what happened was uh, we conducted our mission for those 14 days, undocked, and came home and uh, had a flawless landing. Ended up landing at Edwards Air Force Base. So our preference is to land in Florida, Kennedy Space Center, but the weather didn't allow it, so, uh, so we, went, we went over there. Three hours later, I was at a place in Boron called Domingos. A friend of mine owns the restaurant. I took the whole crew there. Estaba comiendo comida mexicana con una cerveza. So it was, life was good. You know, I just want to close up a little bit uh, with respect to, uh, in terms of my closing remarks, uh, to tell you that, you know, some of the things, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, you know, what are you going to do now, uh, Jose? You know, what, how can you top that? And I'm sure uh, Tony is trembling in his seat right now. <laughs> but but I, w I won't break it to him just yet, but we'll keep that. Uh, no, actually, actually, uh, I'm going to be moving down here to Houston for a six month to one year assignment at NASA headquarters. So I'm gonna be working out of the Office of Legislative Affairs and uh, try to work with our lawmakers with respect to spreading the good word of what NASA does with respect to our mission and objectives. As you know, uh, uh, President Obama changed the mission objectives of NASA just recently. We're actually pretty excited about it. Uh, a lot of people think that the budget got cut. And on, on the contrary, I think the budget got increased. Uh, the International Space Station, which was slated to close in 2015, got extended to 2020, so we're going to be conducting a lot more science. What did get changed a lot is that constellation program that we were working on. It was a uh, Apollo-like architecture capsule that was going to take us to the International Space Station, but take us to the moon where we would set up a long-duration base outpost there and learn how to live on the moon for long durations in hopes of developing the technology that eventually allows us to go to Mars. Uh, that got scrapped. And instead of doing that, what he's doing is, is the resources for that program is going to be spread among private companies so that we can stimulate private companies uh, and technology that, to get commercialized so that these companies can develop their own vehicles. And we would, be, we would have access to these vehicles. And uh, it's, it's in the hopes that things will move a lot quicker and it'll be cheaper to develop. And, uh, and so we're pretty excited about that. And we'll so certainly be working uh, with them in the future to uh, make sure that that's a, a success. The other thing that I've done is I take my role just like um, uh, just, uh, just like being a, uh, the mentor that Franklin Chang did, Diaz was for me. I take my role as a mentor very seriously. To close the story with Franklin Chang Diaz, the, uh, when I got interviewed the third time in, in 2004, uh, and remember I said you get, you get interviewed by a committee, well, he was on the committee, and I was able to uh, meet him for the first time and uh, basically told him the story during my interview process of how I got inspired. Uh, you know, maybe I was just uh, kissing up, but it certainly worked. <laughs> and and so, so, so what happened was, um, you know, it's very important. Role models are very important, and so that's why I take my, my position very seriously uh, with respect to coming out to the community. I was telling Tony that, you know, this Friday, I was here for the Head Start, uh, Migrant Head Start Conference. I was their keynote speaker. Uh, I flew to Sacramento uh, Saturday. I was at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I was their keynote speaker. Flew Sunday back to Houston. Uh, we watched The Lightning Thief, my kids and I. And then, and then uh, as soon as I, we, the movie was over, dropped them off home again, and I flew over here for this conference. So, so I certainly do take my role very seriously about, about uh, being a, a role model and talking to the kids and encouraging them to stay in school. Uh, so much that I have a foundation called Reaching for the Stars. Jose Hernandez Reaching for the Stars, you Google that, you'll see the website to that foundation that uh, we, we, what we try to do with that foundation is very simple, is, is we're trying to increase the number of kids going into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, it behooves us to to increase those numbers because if we're gonna be number one, stay at the number one position uh, from a technical perspective, we need to increase that, uh, the, the, the amount of kids going into science and engineering, especially uh, minorities, Hispanics. Uh, and and so, so, you know, a lot of people, I know there's a lot of talk about immigration reform and all this that needs to be done, but one statistic, I was reading a paper the other day uh, by the National Council La Raza. So Ron Estrada, thank you for providing that data. One, one paper that, that 
one piece of data that sort of astounded me, blew me away, was that if you look at our population of kids less than 18 years old, 91% are US born or citizens, 91%. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm t t telling you is that, you know, we can talk about immigration reform, you know, till the cows come home, but you know, 15, 20 years from now, that ain't gonna matter, because we're here to stay. We're not gonna go back home or anywhere. I mean, we are here, like our kids were born here, they're citizens. And if we're gonna be, continue to be competitive in this world, we have to engage all segments of society to get a good education. And that includes our Latino kids. We have to engage them. And specifically, we have to engage them in the, in the STEM areas. Get them involved in science because that's what makes our country great. That's what is able to make us go to the moon and come back. That's what's gonna enable us to go to Mars and come back. So, so that's what we have to do is we have to keep, keep uh, motivating our kids to move forward and get a good education. So having said that, you know, it's basically a simple recipe for success. You, you have to get yourself a, first of all, it starts at home, the foundation. The foundation support starts at home. You have to have a dream, allow your kids to dream and convert that dream to a plan and then provide a good education for them and perseverance, ganas, corazón, and you put all those ingredients together, like Tony Cárdenas said, sky's not the limit, son las estrellas. So thank you very much. Jose Hernandez, on behalf of the Latino Leaders Network, it's my honor to present you the Nambe Eagle Leadership Award for your outstanding contribution to our community. Thank you very much. There's one question I wanted to ask Mickey is, uh, are they gonna let me on board as carry-on? We'll send this to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I am truly humbled by the award. I, believe me, I take it very serious, the, uh, the responsibilities that we all have as Latino leaders to go back to our community and give back. As lo más importante que podemos hacer, we're going to leave a legacy. That's what it has to be. We have to go back y ayudar a nuestra gente so, so it's a great, great honor, and I'm deeply touched. Mickey, thank you very much for, for bestowing this honor on me. We, I, I really do appreciate it, and it will be prominently displayed in my study, so muchas gracias. Thank you. The one thing I want to present the uh, Latino Leaders Network, uh, Mickey, is a uh, montage of uh, our mission. And if you can see, I'd like to uh, show it to you. It shows uh, several pictures, different phases of our mission that occurred from August 28th to September 11th. More importantly, it has our flag, the American flag, uh, in, in the center. This flag flew with us. And as I mentioned before, it went around the world 217 times, 5.7 million miles. And uh, I am very proud to present this montage to Mickey Ibarra and the, Hispanic, the uh, Latino Leaders Network. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what an outstanding leader. You talk about a lesson in perseverance and patience. I think that would be Jose Hernandez. Thank you so much. Just a couple of closing announcements we'd like to, to make, as is our custom. We have a number of sponsor materials, media partner materials outside the ballroom for, for all of you. Please take what interests you. 
Again, we want to thank Anheuser-Busch and ExxonMobil for making today possible. We look forward to continuing to bring leaders together at the very next Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, as Michelle mentioned, on May 4th. Finally, I want to let everyone know that Jose Hernandez has agreed to personalize the photos that were left on your chairs for those that would be patient. And uh, he'll, we'll have him for 30 minutes following this program outside the ballroom. Again, thank you all for being with us today. <laughs>